just want to let you all know this is the 90th week <laughs> I've done Town Hall Academy, episode number 90, the third edition of the Business Coaches Lab. And we're going to talk about the five dysfunction of a CEO. Am I a CEO? Huh? I just run a small shop. There's, you know, four or five of us, a couple, three bays, a great little neighborhood. I'm a CEO. How cool is that? Thanks so much to <clears throat> Jasper Engines for uh, providing this great, wonderful free access to the aftermarket. Well, so why purchase a Jasper quality remanufactured product? Well, it is their people. I hear about this all the time when I'm out. A Jasper associate is dedicated to high quality customer service, and they do that, I think, the best in the industry. They're committed to excellence and professional, and they've got pride of ownership as part of a 100% associate-owned company. Thank you, Jasper. Well, my panel, Bob Greenwood, Automotive Aftermarket E-Learning Center. Hey, Bob, glad to have you back. Cecil Bullard from the Institute for Business Excellence. Hi, Cecil. Howdy. Jude Larson from the ACT Group. Rick White from 180Biz and Murray Voth from RPM Training. He was missing last time. We didn't know where Murray went. We thought he fell right off the earth, <laughs> but he's, he's back with us. An interesting topic, um, you, you know, when we do these shows, I ask the people that are on to, you know, give me, give me your talking points. And some of the best talking points I've seen uh, came here, and we may not cover them all. And if we don't, I'm going to make sure they're in the show notes page when we repurpose. So, Jude, I'd like, love to have you start us off. Um, we'll, we'll talk about, from your perspective, what could be a, a dysfunction as a CEO? Sure. Um... I think one of the biggest things that comes down to the foundation of, of because, you know, a dysfunction of a CEO is going to be anything that's the opposite of what you need your team or your company to be doing. And so when you look at a, at a team or a company and you look at their behaviors and you figure out what's being allowed, if you will, um, go to that. And that, in my opinion, is what you would refer to as a dysfunction of a CEO because they're letting that happen because the CEO ultimately is the one who is responsible for everything that happens inside of that business. And so it all starts with the foundation of, of trust in the team. There really has to be a very solid uh, foundation of trust. And people don't always understand what that means or what that looks like um, because, you know, uh, sometimes people talk about trust, they'll throw the word uh, vulnerability in there and that can be very scary to a lot of us uh, myself included and so um, they get kind of spooked and can kind of you know you know run from it or you can have the opposite of that which is uh, what I had coined to me years ago called a sea cucumber where the first time you meet them they divulge everything about themselves onto you and that can be a bit much or a bit intense so there's this this uh, radical middle if you will or this perfect uh, uh, tension where you are divulging enough, being vulnerable enough, but not necessarily over the top to where you're scaring people or something like that. So um, trust really stems from, uh, you know, the, the leader being vulnerable and letting people know, you know, what their feelings are, what their emotions are, what their uh, belief system is and why it's there and what they want to do with the company. And, and when, as the leader goes, so goes the team, right? If the leader isn't showing that they trust the team or isn't showing that they're a trustworthy person, it's really difficult to get people to kind of open up to each other and, and show that, that vulnerability that's appropriate in order to uh, kind of be there for each other and believe in each other. Because, I mean, without trust, you're, you're dead in the water. I mean, you can't really move on to anything else. To the coaches, uh, I have a question. If you're a micromanager, does that uh, negate trust? Yes, absolutely. For sure. Yes. 100%. Yeah, 100%. You're, 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 kneecap you're kneecapping your employees. You're telling them, look, I don't believe you can do this. Get out of the way. Hold my beer. Here, I'm going to do it. Yeah. And we think we're showing them how to do something, but in ulti you know, ultimately what we're doing is we're, 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 we're disempowering them. Yeah, we've got to build them up instead, you know, trust, it, you know, Jude, I think that's an excellent point. But trust isn't something where I do A, B, C, and I get trust. Trust is something it's like love. You know, I love my wife, but I can't tell you exactly when I fell in love with her. It was I, I did certain things. She did certain things that built that up. 
And then over time, all of a sudden, based on my level of caring and my competence, credibility, and having their back, all of a sudden, they trust me. Well, yeah, you're absolutely right, Rick. Because when you go in, when you go under, when you start a relationship, let's say your trust level is here, and depending on what happens, it's either going to get deeper or it's going to get shallower. So if somebody violates that trust, you're going to have less trust in them. But if somebody earns more trust, you're going to go, "Wow, this guy has really got my back." I, you know, that trust is going to go deeper. Right. I, I have, call it a trust. You have to. <laughs> you have to start somewhere, though. You have to start with consistency of action, consistency of thought, Correct. and consistency of vision. Absolutely. If you don't have consistency in your vision, your thoughts, and your actions, if those things don't come together, then you're taking away from trust. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but there's also my, counterintuitive. Oh, sorry, Cecil. Go ahead. My my wife loves me. I don't know why, frankly, because I'm I'm not a nice guy. I mean, I have all kinds of flaws. But she cares about me. Why? Consistency of action. For 35 years, consistency of action. I come home every night. I tell her I love her. You know, I care about her. She cares about me. It's a, it's a long-term relationship. But when we started, you know, there was an initial attraction. You got to think about initial attraction in the sense of your business. How do I attract employees to my business to say to them, to, for them to say, wow, this looks interesting. Maybe this would be good for me. And, and that's about um, consistency of vision and consistency of action. There's this counterintuitive circle that happens where you start a business and you're, you know, there's fear involved. You're, you're nervous. You're, you know, you don't want to lose customers. You don't, you don't want, you want to make money, not lose it. And so you end up micromanaging fear. To me, micromanagement is, is an expression of fear. And then what ends up happening is you're so busy doing your employee's job that you're not doing your own. And when you're not doing your own, the employees know that you're not doing your job. And they see that. So then they stop doing their job because you're not doing your job. So if you actually look after the parts that you're responsible for, empower them to do the parts they're responsible for, the cycle actually turns the other way around. It's kind of a, a counterintuitive thing. If you don't have goals and vision, and then, then that's not going to happen. I need to define the roles. I need to define my own roles. One of the first things that I try to do with a client is, is create an org chart. And, and not in the sense that I've got Bill here and he's going to be this position, but what does that position have to accomplish for this business to be successful? Which okay. positions do I need and what does it have to accomplish? Once I've done that, now I can put bodies in place and go, okay, this is your <clears throat> job and, and define it and let them do their job, stay out of their way. When well, do I you'll, jump you'll, in? You'll find when a CEO is in place that, uh, as Jude was saying, it's all about the trust. And one of the questions I like to ask every shop owner, learning how to become a CEO, can you actually look me in the eye and tell me that everyone on your team has your back? Does everybody on your team actually believe you have their back? This is an important culture issue. And if you're micromanaging or doing anything like that, how are you ever, ever going to build that? Right. Now, for me, getting back to the trust, I think a big part of it, Cecil, you're absolutely right. Purpose, mission, everything like that, the values, those are really important. But so isn't intent. If I'm dealing with people trying to get them on board so that I can get something out of them, that's not going to work. I have to care about that person, their life, their family, their goals, their dreams. And I believe, I call it a trust account, right? Where, Jude, you said it, right? We, we, we start and every interaction with somebody is either a deposit in that account or it's a withdrawal in that account. And we can, we can close the account. But, you know, and, and trust is so important to build as a leader, but also to implement change. The more trust there is, the more influence I can have with people. So I, I think both of you, you spot on, great, great, great points. I love the, the, the next um, uh, piece, which is engage in conflict around ideas. Well, you can't engage in healthy conflict if you don't trust each other. Right. You know, there's, there, there's, I always say there's these, these two, there's, there's two things that happen, in, in, in a, one in a healthy company, one in an unhealthy company. In an unhealthy company, my partner or one of my people does something, and I say to myself, why did they put me in this position? Why did they do this, right? Why are they trying to hurt me? And in a healthy company, I, I, I look at it a different way, and I say, wow, they must be doing what they think is right because I trust this person, even if it isn't right. Now we have 
we have a, a conflict around ideas, which is healthy if it's done in an environment where we trust each other. You know, it's, what it's you also think? done in an environment where you're thinking as a team, collectively working on an idea together. Right. But you, you, Consider, which you cannot, you can't do that unless you set it up. Well, the, well, right? you know, from the, the beginning, the trust has to be in place. Absolutely. But the, the whole purpose of building the trust by your actions, behavior doesn't lie. We, we all know that. But the reason we build that trust is so that we can have good, open discussions about things and think about each team member thinking as a partner in the company so that as we go through discussions, what is good for the team? What is good for the company? How do we all win win on these ideas that we're talking about? Right. Very important. I'd like to give an example of actually a, a breakthrough I had with two clients uh, recently around this, around this circle, right? CEO, leader, trust, uh, engaging in ideas and conflict. Uh, the one guy's having difficult challenge with a business partner um, who's dealing with some health issues and, you know, there's some struggles there. It's, it's all getting better. Um, the, guy's, uh, the guy's on the mend. But what's happened is, is they, they weren't paying attention to the team and to the business and the team began to get disengaged from that process and um, just recently talking to them they said we first, we had two staff meetings last last uh, month for the first time in four years and uh, the smile on their faces of how things are going better just on the simple thing of getting the group together to have a meeting and they, they said everybody bring your ideas right and was there a heavy discussion was there conflict yes there was but what the owner realized and he said it right out loud to the to my group he said I realized that I need to listen to everybody's ideas even though they might not be the right idea or they might not be ready to implement that but I've listened to their ideas and the fact that I listened to the ideas actually opened up the comp the floor so I could bring my ideas to the table does that make sense absolutely that's, that's where the rubber meets the road I'm so thrilled for these guys that um, you know they've taken leadership back again <laughs> Having, having meetings and uh, and the rubber's hitting the road again. It's awesome. You know, for me, I, the conflict part, the conflict I think comes from ego. It's when we feel like as a leader, and I, and CEO for me means chief everything officer in a small business. That's what it is, right? I mean, you know, you see the Staples commercial. I'm IT Rick and I'm Coach Rick and and business Rick and everything else, but. I got to realize that when I see my business, it's like I'm in a jar. And, and there's an old saying that says, when you're inside the jar, you can't read the label. And what you really need is you need perspective. And if you can be open and listen to that perspective from other people, there's real power in it. And I think if I have that mindset, it's not conflict. It's being able to see that iceberg from a whole bunch of different angles and it gives me a better view, a real view of what the business is or whatever the subject matter is. So, so in, in a typical small business, um, you have an owner and maybe a couple of guys and all the egos that go along with that, um, no goals, no targets, uh, we're just trying to get through the day, uh, pay the bills and hope there's something left in the pile. I've got to build a structure around that with targets, goals and communication, regular communication. And I got to get my people invested and involved in whatever we're going to do because we're going to do it together. We're not going to do it at all. I can't do it by myself. That's why I need people. And, and a good CEO uh, either, either sets up the communication themselves or has someone in their company that can make sure that communication is happening on a regular basis. Unfortunately, in many small business, we're so busy fixing the cars that we forget to communicate with our staff. We forget to set our goals. We forget to build our trust and our actions. Uh, I was in a shop uh, a couple of days ago, uh, talking to the owner first. Uh, hey, how do you, when, when you're, when you're angry, what do you do? Oh, I, you know, I don't, I don't do much. I'm not, no problem interviewed every one of his employees, every employee said, I don't like the fact that he screams and yells at us pretty regularly. That's not communication. That's not building trust. That's not being a good CEO. I may be frustrated, 
But I can't bring that frustration and that anger into conversations with my staff or I lose because I can't have trust. Yeah. And you're not building that trust by doing that, those kind of actions, that's for sure. And that's certainly not a CEO position. One of the key things about being a CEO is to recognize that you have got to step out of the business and delegate. And you, know, you could have a four-bay shop, whatever, but you delegate positions to people and they report back to you, but you allow them to go at it and trust them that they can do it. And then you have regular communication back and forth. But if you have conflict where the, the employer, the so-called CEO who hasn't learned yet, uh, he's going to really destroy his business or her business just by those kind of actions. Stepping out and realizing you have a very important position to look after because every decision you make affects everybody on that team and their families if you blow it. Guys, I, I want to offer something up here about uh, the idea category. Um, if I don't feel safe, I may not have anything to contribute. I may not have, you know, and, and I think part of trust is also feeling safe that I'm not going to be ridiculed, uh, put in a corner. Right. I have this crazy wild idea that could be just ahead of my time. And the team, I mean, and, and I think of bullying too and, and how conflicts inside of businesses happen. And uh, what, what do you think of having a safe environment, being safe to open your mouth? You know, Mas Maslow says that if we don't feel the basic needs being met and safety and security is one of those basic needs. I mean, I need water, I need food, I need, I need a, a place to stay warm or, or, or cool. Um, but I also need safety and security. And, and if we don't have those basic needs met, we never reach, um, uh, you know, another level, which is thinking about God and, and science and, um, and imagination. Uh, we just don't get there. And so when my employees don't feel safe, they cannot contribute uh, the way that I need them to contribute. Yeah. And, and, I, and when you're not safe, ahead. when you're not safe, you have stress in business. Yeah. And, and stress, the idea that I, uh, stress creates a productivity problem. Yeah, sure. And the idea that I'd like to tie back to what Rick said about, uh, about ego is there's a tendency as us as humans to tie our idea to our ego. So I come to a group and I have an idea and my identity is tied to that idea. So that idea is not accepted. I'm not accepted. But I think what you gentlemen are talking about is, is if we accept the person, we accept the ego and they feel accepted that part. Then we could talk about the ideas not tied to our egos. Now we can toss those around. I have a group of buddies that we talk about all kinds of things, spectrum, radical, all over the map. Yet at the end of the evening, we can all give each other a big hug and say goodnight because we trust each other as friends that we've acknowledged each other as human beings and our egos are safe in a place that we can toss around crazy ideas, right? So just bringing that ego and idea, like separating the two and too many owners feel because they're the boss, because they're the CEO, come in with that whole top down, I'm the boss, my ideas are the best, right? And then that doesn't create an environment of conversation either. I think if you're, I think if you're a good CEO, you routinely allow people to, to have input and uh, often select their ideas even over your own ideas. Um, I, I can give you a, a short example. We, we, uh, we did our logo. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we called a professional. He gave us five, six different things. I picked a, a, a logo that I liked. And then we went to the staff. And I, in the meeting, I kind of said, this is the one I like. And so that was the one that was chosen. But through the grapevine, I get a lot of feedback. <laughs> um, so I called uh, each of my employees and I said, you know, hey, you know, which logo did you really like? And, and, and we don't have the logo that I wanted. We have the logo that everyone agreed upon, and it's a simple, stupid thing, but it brought, it brought the community together. It brought people together, knowing that the CEO who could just put his foot down and go, no, nope, we're going to have this one, did not do that. And, and I try often, if there are two good suggestions that are equally, I think, going to achieve the result, and one of them's not mine, I pick the one that's not mine over the one that's mine more often than not because it, it, then the staff is invested and involved. And I think we, we, as a good CEO, 
it's something we have to be conscious of. You just perfectly rolled into our next point. <laughs> it's just great. What a segue. And I'm going to give it to you in a sec here. You know, here's another reason to choose Jasper engines and transmissions. It's their commitment to continuous improvement, their investment in research and development, product updates, and remanufacturing processes means Jasper provides the perfect product with one of the greatest customer service teams in the industry. A perfect next point, Cecil, to talk about commitment to decisions. Hmm. You just I think you, every, everything you do. So, so when you, when you're in a, when you're in a meeting, uh, any meeting, staff management meeting, even one-on-one, -on -one, you know, there's, I, I think there's a cycle that happens if you do it correctly. You know, you walk in there with an idea, um, you have discussion around that idea, you get the employee or the, per, the, the team or whoever to say, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, you strategize the idea. Somebody uh, is assigned to do the work. Um, we, we figure out what that work looks like, what we think it looks like, and what we think the result's going to be. And then someone goes and does the work. Um, uh, uh, everything that you want to do, you want to commit for some period of time to see what the result is. If you're smart and you're trying to create new actions, uh, new habits in your company, then you, you commit to a minimum of 30 days. It takes about 28 days to create a new habit. But there's always the idea that if this doesn't work, we can always go back to what we used to do in that particular area. So there's always kind of, in my world, there's always kind of an out. We just never get to the out because we've decided what we're going to do. We, we watch what the person does. Uh, we, we, we help them in what they do. And there's rewards. There's, there's a, a follow-up at the end that basically looks at it once we've done it right and says, did that accomplish what we wanted to accomplish? If the answer is yes, congratulations, we've done something great. If the answer isn't, we go back to strategy and say, what could we have done differently or what should we do differently to achieve the result that we want? So there's a, there's a process around it. Um, I think as a, as a CEO, I don't think you commit I think you commit to every decision until you don't commit to that decision. If, if your decision is found to be incorrect, not getting the company what they want, I think as a good CEO, you have to be rec you have to recognize that and go that oops, you know, you, I, I made a mistake or we made a mistake or, you know, we've gone down there. It's not the end of the world. Um, I don't think you stick to every decision, not I'm committed to do the actions. I'm committed to see the results but I'm not committed to make sure that this thing is always the thing that we do. I think too, you've got to look at every decision that's being made is how does it fit into the ultimate vision as to where the company's going to go? Because every CEO should and must prepare a vision for the company, as you mentioned, Cecil and Rick and Jude and Marie, these, these things have to fit in. How does it fit into our vision? And then the commitment can be made. And the biggest thing about any commitment is don't say, we're just going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. Put a date line to it. Mm, have, yep. have an objective, a date line that keeps things accountable. And yeah. th th that is the CEO's responsibility, thinking it through, okay, then this date line can be met. And when you're doing these decisions, don't implement a whole pile of things at once. I've always believed the maximum you do is two things at a time, yeah. max but they're date line driven so that we can have a monitoring and accountability process. There's, 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 go ahead, Murray. I was going to say there's this great uh, uh, jobber or company, independent job parts jobber in Eastern Canada with about 30 stores. And uh, they have a, a management game. They play with their team that um, you get uh, one point for making a decision. You get two points for making uh, the right decision and you get no points for not making a decision. They push their people to make a decision even if it's not right and they, that place just blossoms all the time. And it's nothing that's documented per se. It's a game that management developed to play with each other and uh, it creates this huge culture of the employees are free to make decisions. And it's like do the right thing for the customer. So customers of that parts job or just love them because they, they do the right thing. And do they make mistakes? Of course they do, right? But like you say, so you can back up. There, there, are, there are four things that you have to walk away from uh, every discussion. I need to know what we're going to do. I need to know how we think we're going to do it. I need to know who's responsible, and I need to know when it's going to happen. 
um, in, in, in my meetings, those are always essentials. And, yeah, I would add why. Uh, well, well w the why is part of the vision. We, we've okay. already discussed it because we know right. what our, our clarity on our vision, it fits right. in. It fits in our picture. Um, you also talk about trust. When you come to your staff and you say, we're going to do this thing, and then you don't um, follow up and that thing never happens, you're actually delete, depleting that trust account that Rick talks about. Um, as a CEO, when I come in and I go, you know, we're going to do this and everybody agrees that we're going to do this and we have the discussion, we just say what, when, you know, who and, and, and what time and, and, and how, and we got it all figured out, and we got it documented. If I don't follow up with that and make sure that that happens, I'm breaking trust. I'm actually hurting the trust with my employees. When I go, hey, we talked about that. That's not happening. I need to know why because this thing's going to happen. And my, uh, my staff understands I'm not going to let us just throw it off to the wayside. You know what? We may do it and we may fall on our faces, but darn it. I said we're going to do it. We said we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And after we fall on our faces, we can all laugh and go, well, that wasn't it, right? And we can pick something else. Um, but we're not going to let it just fade away uh, for lack of management. I've I got a couple of things. You know, there's a, to, to your point, Cecil, there's this old saying, I ask clients this all the time. There are four, there are four birds on a wire, a telephone wire. And one of them decides to fly off. How many birds are there still there? And, every, you know, the typical answer I get is, well, there's three birds. And I, I say, no, there's four. Making the decision isn't enough. We have to follow yeah, up. Yeah, he has to fly away. What's that? He didn't fly away. He just thought about it. <laughs> exactly, right? And Welcome think, to small business. Exactly. And, and I think one of the things we've got to talk about is, you know, we've got to look at who our, our target audience is here. Is they're business owners. They're going 90 miles an hour. They're going nuts. But they got to understand that there's a difference between decision and dictating, mm -hmm. right? Today, we are in the age of compliance, not, uh, not in the age of compliance. We were in the age of compliance. I grew up in the age of compliance. If I asked my father why we're doing something, it was a painful ride home, <laughs> okay? So today, we're in the age of commitment. We cannot force things on people today. They don't work for us. They work with us. So... We've got to be able to get them involved with the decision-making process, let them feel heard, talk to them about why we decide what we're going to do, because ultimately it's still, you're the one that's got to write the checks. So you've got to make sure that it, that it makes sense. Um, the other thing is, there's so much good stuff around today. Uh, to your point, Cecil, if I'm not focused on my mission and my purpose, like Bob said, and Cecil, then I'm going to, I'm going to, have a problem knowing, you know, if I do a lot of good, there's an opportunity cost where I miss out on the grade over here. So I've, if I'm focused on what I want and where I'm going, I can separate and stay with the, hey, that's a good idea, but this is a great idea and go with that. And then the last thing I want to say is something that Thomas Jefferson once said, to your point, Cecil, is uh, Thomas Jefferson once said, be flexible with the path and firm in the destination. And I think that's so important. People get so into making that decision and having that be part of them, as Murray said, that they can't see it's not working for them. And I don't, you know, when I talk to clients, I don't care how many times we have to change strategies, we don't change goals. I think that's really important. And that's, you. Where your, that's where your commitment comes in, Rick, and I, and I totally agree with you. So my, my concern is when I, I hear the industry, uh, you know, I want you to buy into this. That does not create a team. Uh, when you have a culture in business, I don't want you to buy into it. I want you to believe in where we're going. Right. Be a part to be and want to be part of it. Right. When you are a part of it, your opinions count, your thoughts count, and we are collectively making decisions together because we believe together where we're going. And so, you know, yes, we deal with egos, but the fact is, is when the ego believes in where we're going, it's amazing how they can still work together and be very productive in achieving things. There's, I, was talk great. About, I always talk about my millennials and, and um, my kids, right? They're all millennials. And it's amazing. To me. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Not me. It's amazing to me 
that if they don't want to do something, you cannot force them. You can't make it happen no matter what. But if they want to do something, if they're invested in it, if they think it's going to be good for them, you can't hold them back. And that's true of employees. If you can get them, um, you know, I think vision is probably the most important thing. Can I, do I have a clear vision of who, who I want us to be? And can I share that such that other people, they, they take that vision on as their own. And, and once I've got that, now I have a bunch of uh, uh, millennials, don't care what age you are, who can't be stopped because they want that vision, what that vision is, because they believe in it, because they, they feel it, they, they want to be a part of it, and they see that vision uh, helping them achieve whatever their targets are, goals in, in life. I have to create that as a CEO, or, or we're not going where we need to go. And, and you don't see so with the, the millennials the way they are, too. Um, they want to believe in it. They, once they believe in it, look out. They have a passion to achieve it. And that passion oh, comes I'm, I'm not allowed loud to and clear. And, you know, they have one thing my, my kids have taught me. They said, Dad, your generation just doesn't get it. I said, <laughs> what's that? He says, you guys seem to live to work. We're going to work to live. So we're going to be very passionate about when we're on our mission and achieving that. But outside of that, we're going to have a life and a good life with it. Thank you all for that. Jude, I have to ask you, when I saw this commit to decisions, realizing a dysfunction would be the opposite of it, in your coaching um, world, how many shop owners, CEOs, have you found decide against a decision that they made 30 days ago who never told anyone and now the whole world's in chaos because we thought we were yanging and now we're yanging <laughs> yeah it can certainly happen and it that's just from um you know lack of uh, leadership training or development um which is you know key to being able to implement all these things and it's interesting as we're going through these points and it, it's all so intertwined and mingled i know we're doing our best job we can to keep them all separate but we're we're dipping into other areas and I, I, it's just a fantastic conversation it is i am i'm thrilled where this is going i'm i i have to tell you i think this is going to be the academy award winner in, in, in the <laughs> that we've ever had. I, I think we can really shake some worlds out there uh, from, uh, from our listener base. Number four, uh, guys, and, and again, you're right. Everything's intertwined. It's a, it's a spider web of, uh, of great dialogue here. Rick, hit us with number four. Hold one another accountable. Okay, hold one another accountable. Well, here's the thing. I think accountability really has, when we talk about accountability, we need to set it up. So the first thing we need to do is we need to, uh, number one, have clear vision, purpose, values, goals. We have to understand what everybody's expectations are, what they need to do to contribute. And then we need to, as to Bob's point, which was excellent, we don't want them to agree with us. We want them to be a part of it and, and get them so that they are a, a team. And then what we're going to do is give them feedback we're going to coach for improvement. And those are all the components of accountability. One of the things a CEO needs is courage. They need the courage to be able to set those values and to set the vision and the, and the goals. Even when somebody gives you an eye roll. I mean, if you're married, you've seen an eye roll. In fact, I tell my wife that an eye roll now means I love you. So when she gives me an eye roll, I just <laughs> smile at her. So the whole idea here is, in my opinion, is accountability is about setting the destination, knowing the path, and keeping everybody on the path. But it's not one way. Your people need to keep you accountable to what you said you were going to do, mm -hmm. right? One of the things, I call it the accountability mirror. We hold people accountable to what they say they're going to do, but we hold ourselves accountable to what we meant to do. Like if I didn't get it done today, it's no big deal. I'll do it tomorrow. But we don't hold, we don't hold them to the same standard. So when I talk to, to business owners, I, this is one of the things I talk about is hold yourself to the same standard you're holding others. Did you do it or did you not? And what are we going to do about it? So one of, the, yeah. one of the biggest problems I see, Rick, is what you're mentioning in, in accountability is when a 
business owner, CEO is supposed to be carrying out their function properly. They must keep everybody accountable. Yet they have a young team and they have a couple of older members who have been with the company 10, 15 years. And for some reason, the young team has to be held accountable, but the witness that the boss doesn't keep the older team accountable while well, they've been with me for 15 years. And that really disturbs me because that cannot create stress in a business. It creates stress amongst employees. And the team does not gel together because they see the boss talking out of both sides of their mouth. Mm. I have to be accountable, but you let him or her away with it. What's wrong with that picture? Well, you know, he's been with us 15 years. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot take responsibility for somebody else's life if they don't want to be part of this company. They are affecting everybody else in the company. It's time the bus door gets open. Do you Powerful know the point, Bob? That's 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 an excellent point. I, I need to add one more thing though, and, and I know everybody else got lots of stuff. I, I forget I'm actually on the panel supposed to be talking. I'm listening and like you know, <laughs> referencing my own life and thinking about all this stuff. So, um, uh, accountability. Uh, the the best accountability. Now let's let's just make a huge leap of faith right now. We've gone through all these other things. We've built all this stuff. We have the trust. We have the, the, the conflict that is uh, productive. We have commitment and you hit accountability. The most powerful accountability that I've ever experienced is when the team actually keeps each other accountable. It's not just the leader or the CEO who's right. saying, do it, do it, do it, do it. But the team member walks over to the other guy and puts his arm around him or her and says, well, maybe not her. Keep it, keep it real. Um, <laughs> and says, hey, didn't you say you were gonna have X, Y, Z done by one, two, three? And they say, yes. And they go, so well, it's four, five, six, so you know, what, what are we gonna do here? We need that done, because I can't get this done until you get that done. And when that happens, it's, uh, I mean, that is a wonderful thing. That's when a CEO locks himself in his office and sheds a little tear and, and gets super excited about, you know, watching him grow up so fast and, and all that kind of stuff, because it, it's it's amazing when it happens internally and you don't have to be the one always standing there going oh you didn't do that oh wait this needs to happen still so that's exhausting work and it does tend to be a bit more like you know dad coming down on you the the the, the, the painful ride home um, experience then when a co-worker comes up and, and holds them accountable they're more like yeah you're right I totally missed that you know I'm gonna make it right I'm gonna get it done right now you know, and it's, it's, it's super powerful. It takes a while to set it up and you got to build that environment. You got to build all these things we talked about um, to get there. But once you get there, it is like heaven on earth. I mean, it is fantastic. Well, one of the ways I've been working with my clients with this is uh, to really bring it back to how do you start that? Like we want to have that, right? And a lot of shop owners don't know how to run a staff meeting, a team meeting. And I've got a whole group of people doing a toolbox meeting for seven minutes a day. And the thing that I've discovered, and they're working at this, is have the, me the meeting the same time of the day. Some shops, it'll be at 8 in the morning. Some shops, it'll be at 10, noon, 1. It doesn't matter. Have it at the same time. The other reason why people don't do staff meetings is we keep waiting for everybody to be there. And I says, don't. Have it every time. doesn't matter if one advisor is on a test drive with a customer, or it doesn't matter if somebody's you know, cleaning up something in the parking lot that broke. It doesn't matter. Because here's the thing. If there's a meeting every day for five minutes, and you're not part of it, what are you going to do when you get back to the shop or if you're late for work? You're going to go ask somebody, what did you guys talk about? Peer pressure, when I was a kid, was always this negative thing. Don't hang out with the kids at the pool hall. That's the, Peer pressure is a positive <laughs> thing. The right? Peer hall. pressure is neutral. <laughs> peer pressure is neutral. Use it. That's what happened? Guy, you must have gone to the pool hall. Huh? <laughs> that's, 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 that was oh. my mistake. <laughs> oh, my goodness. goodness. You have to have certain things in order to create accountability. You have to have a target. You have to get agreement from people that that's the right target. They have to buy in, whatever you want to call it. You have to have measurement, measurement that makes sense to everyone. And, and then there, you have to have follow-up. Somebody has to be watching. Now, if the team's watching, it's wonderful. And that's really what you want to create. But if not, the CEO better be watching. And every time you allow someone, either team-wise or individual-wise, not to do the job right and there's no consequence you're you're pulling buckets out of your trust account and and and, and now people don't feel that they they're invested and so they i can't be a part of this team because it's not fair it's not right this guy can do that or that gal can do this 
that that has to go away. It, we, we have rules for our team meetings. And one of the rules is we need to say what needs to be said. And along with that is don't take it personal. Don't make it personal unless it's personal. So, you know, I uh, someone had on the on the messaging, you know, how about team members holding the CEO accountable? You bet. 100%. I have people call me on the carpet all the time in in meetings, in general meetings, in a nice way, uh, uh, and individually. Uh, if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, they have an opinion about that, and I I better hear it, and I better believe that that has validity. Um, I have this saying, and I learned it from Larry Moore, uh, because I used to get really um, uh, prickly whenever anybody uh, criticized me at all, uh, very defensive. And my saying is. Their react, their their. Uh, um, let me see. I can't even think of it now. See, there you go, <laughs> white hair. Their perception is my is my reality, um, and I think not not taking time to look at the perception of your team members about the team, about the company, about themselves and their place in the company, and and deal with whatever that is because you're blinding yourself because you don't want it to be that way, is 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 a dysfunction. I need to be looking at the perception of my team members. And if the perception is incorrect, we need to do whatever it takes to get that perception back in place. Right. Um, you know, uh, someone asked about mission statement. Yeah, we, ha we have exceptionally clear mission statement. We have, uh, we have pillars. We have four pillars that we judge what we do upon. Uh, we have direction. Uh, we have an ethics document that we've uh, all sit down and wrote up for our company. You know, uh, we, we annually meet together for two days and I bring in a consultant, you know, oh my gosh, to help my company communicate better and get on the same track and on the same target. Um, I can tell you that those are the best days that we spend in my company, those two days, every year. You know, see, so I, I, to make a simple, and this is a very simple point or statement, is that Everything you mentioned is an observation. The CEO must observe. The CEO must engage. The CEO must do this and participate. Pay attention. Pay attention. Look at our industry seriously. Too many shop owners work in the business. They have no time to play and understand the role and learn to be a CEO when they're under a voice themselves. And it really concerns me because they cannot step out and start to learn how to run their business properly, to take it to the next level when they're so engaged and working in it. And this is a profession today. I mean, uh, I sound like a broken record, but the trade days are done. And this profession demands that the owner learn that position all over again. And if they don't want to learn it, please leave because you're affecting people's lives. You're affecting the business. Whereas in your you, own, in your you, family. In your family. You are not taking your responsibility. Stop playing this as a hobby. And I don't mean that to be rude. It's just you look at the long term of what they're doing. They are not engaged in being a true owner today in this complicated profession. Hey, Bob, I let me ask you a question to that end, if I may. What do you think about if a, uh, let's say you have a shop owner and they, they, they come to that realization that I, I don't enjoy that, it's not my thing, I'd much rather be working on cars. What do you think, just like a corporation would, of them bringing in a CEO or leader person to then drive that vision? Absolutely. But you know what their biggest problem is? Is their own ego. They oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, but if they can get past that, Absolutely. bring somebody in, they're way Absolutely. better off. And, and give this, them the power, and they will do it. They'll make it happen. There's this thing in the way, and it's called necessity. Um, and I think that we, we use this thing as, a, as an excuse and as a, uh, as a means to stay with what we know. The necessity is, I have to get these cars done. The necessity is... Um, we have to get this money in the bank so that I can make payroll. The necessity, necessity, necessity. I don't care how you do it. You have to spend time or someone in the company has to spend time on the direction of the company, on, on building trust, on communication, all the things that a CEO needs to do. When I took over the last shop I ran, I worked 80 hours a week. I ran the front counter. And you want to know when I did the CEO stuff? After. And I did that for months until I found and hired a good person who could take something off my shoulders, the writing of the service. 
And then I spent more time in CEO and management. And then I hired another person and trained another person. And then I spent even more time. Eventually, <laughs> that's where I ended up completely. I think Stephen Covey, in his, um, you know, his, his quadrants, basically, said we, we spend so much time on necessity when we should be spending time in that other quadrant of planning and, and, and preparing and, and educating and sharpening the saw. Uh, Rick? Go ahead, and then and then let me uh, let me follow up. Okay, so I agree completely. It's all the it's it's the difference between riding a horse. You could ride a horse and get movement, or you could be on a rocking horse and get motion. And you want the movement. It's critical. Um, getting back to accountability, I truly believe you don't want to be the one holding everybody accountable because if you are, you're turning into a babysitter and daddy syndrome is what I call it. What you want to do instead is have everybody hold each other accountable, but you have to teach them how to do it positively. You yep. don't want somebody going up and saying, hey, dummy, what did you do wrong? We have to do it in a way that is receptive and, and nurturing and empowering on both sides. The other thing, the other thing, go ahead, go ahead, Cecil. The numbers hold us accountable if we're paying attention. Yes. Because we have targets. We know what we're supposed to be doing, and we use our numbers to help hold us accountable. Right. And then the other thing I wanted to come, come up with or, or discuss is the fact the reason we don't hold people accountable today is because we're afraid. Fear is a killer to accountability because if I'm afraid, if I hold someone accountable and they walk out and I don't have a pipeline for potential candidates now – then I am going to be constantly living in fear as an owner and the employees are going to be like sharks. They're going to smell it. And I'll tell you what, before you know it, you're going to be bent so far back over. You're a welcome mat, not an owner. You have to be able to hold people accountable. But Thanks, we haven't Rick. had a lot of role models in this industry either. So no. this is a good oh, conversation. That's a great point. I, I, don't know that I, I don't know that I'd agree with that. I think we have lots yeah. of role models. I think you got five of them, six of them, Right now, <laughs> yeah, on, on, I'm talking on, in the bigger, in the bigger know, picture, in the bigger to your, picture. To your point, Murray, I was sitting here and I was putting myself in in the place of the audience, and they're so wrapped up in this, they're they're totally bought in, and then the next thing is, so how do I change? How do I start? How do I be better? How do I? And so the answer is, is and, and I've learned this over three hundred and seventy episodes. The top guys, they all have business coaches. And this is the business coaches lab. And so all I recommend is to anyone, go to any of the business coaches labs and, and look at these guys' links to their websites. And maybe you want to hire one of these guys. Hey guys, a family keeps their vehicle an average of 11 plus years. And so where would be the first place to turn when their drive train fails? Why Jasper, of course. An engine or transmission is a major purchase and it should be trusted to a 100% owned company for quality remanufactured products. Thank you, Jasper, for um, bringing the Town Hall Academy to the automotive aftermarket. This has been fabulous. We have, one, we have a fifth point we'd love to talk about. And Bob, I'm going to toss it off to you. In summary, basically the way I look at it, the CEO has five key things to be able to achieve results. As we first started off our conversation in this hour, we talked about vision and the importance of creating a vision. What is the business going to look like two years, three years from now? By the way, I'm a very big believer because of the complexity of our industry and how it's moving forward that a CEO has got to be ready to reinvent themselves every three years now uh, to stay on top of that. So first of all, get that vision together. The second point is they've got to bring in the ability, the skill level to achieve that vision. That means I've got to always be on the outlook for quality people uh, who have a true desire to continuously learn. I'm learning culture must be in that business every day now for moving forward. So uh, I have to bring on the team to create the vision. Then I have to have them believe in the vision, that they want to be part of it and participate in it and think it through and make sure we can achieve it. Then I have to give them the fourth thing, which is resources. I've got to give them every tool possible to achieve that vision. 
And when they have that, then I measure it, as we all believe, through mathematics, the action plan, are we on the right path? Because math doesn't lie. And when you follow the math in your business, it will tell you where you're going, whether you're on the right road or not. And get off the emotional bank account. That doesn't work. To follow the math and measure your business properly. Unfortunately, I think too many people are still measuring sales and car count, sales per RO. That's activity measurement. And what you want to get into is productivity measurement. Productivity creates the income, the proper incomes, not only pay our people professionally, but also earn a great bottom line so you can continue to move the business forward. All of us agreed on one thing. There's no silver bullet in this industry. It's, it's a lot of hard work. And it's the key is getting over our worst enemy. And our worst enemy for any business owner is their self-discipline to execute. Self-discipline is our enemy. And let's look in the mirror and make a commitment to move things forward, take our time, think clearly, work on the business. Things happen. Things happen. But it is a easily a two- to three-year process. Let's understand that. A CEO sees that, understands it, and has the patience to execute it. Two things. There's a, there's a wonderful book <clears throat> by a guy named Charles Coonrod, and it's called Scorekeeping for Success. Why do we need to achieve results? Why do we need to achieve collective results? We're teaching our people to win, and we're showing them when they win, and we're helping them win, and we're patting them on the back when they win so that they become winners. Um, this is about creating that culture. This is about if you don't have, <coughs> excuse me, targets that you can look at and see that you're achieving results, you're not building the trust that you need to build. You're not building the uh, momentum, the enthusiasm, uh, uh, because there's going to be some tough times along the way. And you need to bring those uh, experiences of success in and go, okay, it's tough right now, but remember, we're successful. We are winners here. We know how to get the job done. And, and, and we, we want to have goals. We want to have targets, if for no other reason than to help our people win, teach our people to win, and help our people become winners. Because when they win, we win, our customers win, everybody wins. Yeah, I want to remind everybody of something that one of you said within the last 20 minutes um, to do with, you could you could set vision, you could set goals and results, but you still have to plan an action and a timeline, right? I, I heard a great saying a while ago is um, you can't plan, uh, you, you can't plan results. You can only plan actions. You can create or create result, right? So the idea is, is what are you going to do when I put a timeline on it? So I just want to remind everybody, one of you made that comment earlier to tie back to what the two of you just said, right? Look at it this way in terms of the five key things that I just pointed out. Vision ability, motivation, resources, action plan. What if you're missing the vision, but you got the other four? That creates confusion in the company. Mm -hmm. What if you got vision, but no ability, no skill level to achieve it? That creates anxiety in the company. Frustration. What if you got vision and ability, but you have no motivation because they don't believe in it? Then you have only gradual change. It takes forever to get anything done. Or what if you failed to give them the resources? Now you got a frustrated team. We can't achieve what you know. We need this, this, and this. Or what if you don't have the proper action plan to measure it? Now you have a false start because you don't know what road you're going down. You're working on the emotional bank account. As a CEO, a as a CEO you have so much responsibility on your shoulders today. Hey, we need a recording of that. We're, yeah, right, yeah, I think this... I think this will be recorded. Um, there's an idea of failure. Um, uh, uh, we, we th in my company and when we train, we talk about failure as a necessary step to success. Um, if we're not paying attention and we're failing and we have no means to look at that in a healthy way, then we become fearful of action and things don't happen. Uh, I'm going to fail. My team is going to fail. Uh, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to—I don't even know if they're mistakes. We're—you don't know what you don't know. But we're always moving forward. Um, and we're—and when we fall on our face, we're going to pick ourselves up, pick each other up, and 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 say, oh, "Okay, that didn't work. Wow, we learned something valuable. Now, what do we think we need to do?" I think that fits right in 
uh, with what Bob is talking about. You know, that action plan, that measurement uh, helps me understand when I'm doing the right thing. I think in shops, you know, I always have this idea uh, if I could, if I could do the one thing for every shop owner that they wanted, it's uh, give me another 10 cars a day, but that's not going to solve your problem. If you don't have margin, if your people are not productive, if you can't get the work out, if they don't know what to do, you could have all the calls, cars in the world and it's only going to hurt your business. Okay, you, I, I, I got to share a fact with you, Cecil, is that uh, studying enough shops and I know you have too, but I've done the math. Do you recognize that the average shop is five bays? Out of the average shop alone, they are missing between $25,000 and $30,000 net profit per bay per year out of the current business coming through the door, and nobody wants to talk about this. Yeah. My, my, my math says very simply, typical shop is losing somewhere around $250,000 a year between uh, productivity and, and margin. And, uh, and that doesn't count the work that they're not finding and they're not, not selling to their clients that should be found and sold. Um, now, I don't need any more cars in, the, in a typical oh. shop. I need to understand how to run my business correctly. And if exactly. I understand how to run my business correctly, I make all kinds of money. I have very happy customers and I can overpay my staff and yeah. still a well-paid team, a well-paid team. Nothing yeah. wrong with having the reputation. We got the highest paid team in the market. Exactly. What a great reputation to have. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I'll, I'll throw my two cents in real quick. I think what we're really talking about here today is becoming a leader of your business. And you, you have multiple hats that you wear. You could be wearing a tech hat or an advisor hat. And typically we're so stuck in the activity, we never put the leader hat on. And we're not talking about, you know, stop doing this today and start doing this. Start being the leader today. What you need to do is just start, start to schedule your hat. Set, set some time aside every day so that you can be the leader of your company. See, I believe a leader needs two core skills. They need to be able to hug really hard and they need to be able to spank hard. Some of us are so driven by numbers and activity, we're real good there, but we're not good on the people side. And then we have other leaders or other owners that are really good with people, but they can't hold them accountable to the numbers. We need to do both. Our people need to know that we care unconditionally for them, and at the same time, we're gonna hold them to a standard that will not deviate. Because let's face it, guys, you think you're setting your standard. You're not. It's what you tolerate. That's your standard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's what you allow and where you spend your time. I always say that, you know, the, the employees are watching. They're going to see what you spend your time on. And if that's the most important thing to you, then that's what's going to be the most important thing to them. And, and you know, I need to be spending my time. I, I, I'm not a great hugger, but, man, I'm a good spanker. <laughs> So, um, I have other, are. <laughs> I have other, I have other people in my company, however, that are better huggers and we use that. And even I allow them to hug me every once in a while. Um, we need, we, you know, every time that we don't set goals, every time that we don't hold someone accountable, every time that we're not looking at the results, we're taking away from that trust bucket, that, that bucket's getting emptier and emptier and emptier. We have to have a very clear vision. Uh, I don't want to repeat what Bob said, but you know, we, we, we need people to be invested. Uh, we need to have measurement. Uh, we need to have communication. We need to have strategy. Um, somebody's got to go work. And then we need to have follow-up. And the follow-up is where the hugs and the spankings happen. And, and it has to happen consistently for all the right things. People watch what you do. If I could throw one last point in here, I think it's important for us to back up just a half a pinch and because a lot of people don't even maybe understand what the difference between a CEO or a leader is and what a manager is. You know, a manager manages activity. They just, you give them a process and they just make sure that process keeps running. Um, a leader is the one we've been talking about or a CEO that they have the vision They ha and they have to build that vision and build it into their people and align their people to it. <laughs> in a very organic way, not a force way. And that's how you move through this path and go through all of these things and create what we're talking about. You know, to line the up with thing. what Rick said there, um, 
I've had some people who are so activity based owners and some of them may be listening in today and they're like, guys, this is great, but where do I even start? And Rick, you were talking about scheduling that. I've had a few shop owners who have committed to a half hour a week to sit in their office, lock the door and think about their business. And I met a guy at a convention uh, last year and he says, Murray, he says, I'm up to seven hours a week now. <laughs> that's, and that's all we need to do. That's right. two hours a day. Every day. Every day. Start with a half hour a week. A day. Eventually you get to two hours a day and then away yeah. you go. Right. So, yeah. so start, start guys, just start, lock yourself in the room, tell your staff you're not available. Don't go on Facebook <laughs> except for these things. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. And if I, and and if I may, <laughs> And if, you, and if you're not comfortable at the shop doing that, go yes. home. Go yes. home yeah, go and do somewhere it. Somewhere else. Yeah. Right. The world is not it. No. And, <laughs> you know, and if I may, if you'll just step back and look at the most successful shop owners in Canada or the United States, mm-hmm. they have transitioned themselves from the shop to the counter and from the counter to being the owner and the leader. Mm-hmm. These are the most successful shop owners that you have, multi-store owners, etc. Take a lesson from them, model them, learn, and just start making the changes towards it so that you can have what they have. Wow. Um, Time for hour number two. Hurts. My head hurts. <laughs> this was so good. <laughs> Sorry about that, Carm. I do that a lot. No, no, that's Cecil okay. will this, give you a this, hug. This was absolutely great. Hey, j- just just to recap what we talked about, uh, a million things, but in these kinds of order, trust one another, engage in conflict around ideas, commit to decisions, hold one another accountable, and then that focus on achieving collective results here at the end. This was a hard-hitting um, panel. Would you come back again to do another Business Coaches sure. Lab? You bet. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Sure. Thank you so Love much. Thank we you. Need a, um, we need a paddle, though. Pardon? We gotta like have a talking <laughs> stick. Yeah, I know. Yeah, somebody should put up there, put up a paddle. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Somebody should should kind of do this. Can I say something now? <laughs> Thanks to Bob Greenwood from Automotive Aftermarket Learning Center and Cecil Bullard from the, from the Institute of Business Excellence. Jude Larson from the ACT Group. Rick White from 180 Biz and Marie Voth from RPM Training. Great weekend, fellas. Thanks for the contribution. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Pleasure. Bye, everybody. Take care, guys.